So you decided to sell your house. You wouldn't let someone else make that decision. No, not at all. I sell my own house. I was told that someone is buying my house. Who is selling my house? We're going to get to all that, okay? <laughs> That's why we're here. We're helping you, okay? We're not going to let all of that happen. Please. That's why we're here, okay? At the highest possible level, when you think about Rona's case, how would you describe it? As one of the most extreme examples of elder financial abuse I've ever seen. Rona was one of the sweetest ladies that I ever talked to and met, and her story was, was heartbreaking. We typically trust people in positions of authority to look out for our well-being. In the case of Rona, it turns out the sheepdog was actually the wolf at the door. It was the worst case I'd ever heard of law enforcement being involved in that way. It just doesn't sound like this would really happen, that you would have two law enforcement people supposedly taking care of an elder, helping that elder, and in fact, taking her assets and putting her on an airplane to her home country, thousands of miles away. That one just sounds like, you know, who's making this one up? But we didn't make it up. It was real, and we prosecuted it. Rona was an elderly woman living alone in her home that she'd lived in for a very long time, 45 years almost. She was tending her rose garden outside every day with her husband, working in the yard, getting along just fine. And then her husband died and the neighbors started noticing that she wasn't outside as much. They didn't see the husband anymore. And when they talked to Rona, they found out that her husband had died and she was struggling. She had never really had to do anything for herself as far as household finances or anything like that. So she didn't know what to do. And she was befriended by a neighbor who helped her out, uh, Peggy. Peggy helped Rona pay her bills, made sure everything was taken care of, drove her where she needed to go. And in that way, Rona was doing just fine before law enforcement got involved. The event that starts this case is a call to law enforcement. January 14th, 2018, a neighbor calls 911 to report that Rona is in front of their house, confused, crying, and trying to find her brother. The brother actually lives up in the Pacific Northwest and nowhere near where Rona would have been looking for him. A welfare check was called. So Deputy Amos responded. She came out, she saw Rona, and she made contact with her. And she asked her what was wrong, and she found out that a gentleman named Bob was living with Rona and possibly taking advantage of her. Initially, Deputy Amos, at least on the surface, was acting like a good Samaritan officer and wanted to help Rona and even took her to get food to a local fast food restaurant as an act of goodwill. And while that was something that was good, and in fact, Amos got a commendation from the department for that, it was against policy. Amos returns Rona to her home despite the claims concerning Bob's questionable actions toward Rona. So several days after Deputy Amos had taken Rona out for lunch and dealt with the welfare check. She and her partner, uh, Deputy Miller, show up to Rona's house without any kind of call. They just drove by and stopped at the house. And at that point, they talked to Rona and they saw a gentleman named Bob who told the deputies he was living at the house. During that initial encounter, Deputy Amos learns that a transient with a criminal record who goes by the name Bob and is known by the Sheriff's Department is staying with Rona. The neighbors believe Bob may be financially abusing Rona. Amos described Bob as a sketchy looking character who didn't look like he belonged in that neighborhood. And upon talking with Rona, they decided that Bob 
didn't really live at the house. He was just kind of squatting there, and they had a conversation with him and convinced him that he needed to leave. And in the course of doing that, they found out that he had several thousand dollars of cash. And when they asked Rona about that money, I believe she had said something to the effect of, oh, you know, that was gambling winnings from a trip we took to an Indian casino. And they determined it wasn't Bob's and they gave that money back to Rona and Bob left the house. Amos and Miller confiscated approximately $3,000 in cash. Amos says she puts the $3,000 into Rona's freezer to hide it from Bob in case he does come back. Neither Amos nor Miller does any paperwork on their interaction with Bob or anything else stemming from their time at Rona's residence that morning. Deputy Amos took it upon herself to look after Rona and not look after her in a way that you might think a law enforcement officer would. But Deputy Amos moved Rona into her own apartment. When I look at Rona's case, I think about were there other cases like it? And in fact, there was a case that the Wolf of the Door covers where it was a law enforcement person who befriended an elder and ultimately had that elder give all of her assets to him. It was quite a scandal, but there's certainly times you can look at the fiduciaries, sometimes CPAs, more often family members or caregivers that do this kind of victimization of elders. When I look at the Wolf of the Door, I think that the top three lessons that we can learn from it are, it's very common that those that commit financial elder abuse try to cover up their actions by blaming others. It's very common that people who do these things either claim that they were doing it with the best of intentions or that the family didn't care for the elder and they were the only ones who did and they did nothing wrong. They make it into a situation where, oh, well, my mom had all of these reasons why not to be close with my brother, and she didn't want him to have anything, so that's why she gave it all to me. So they'll put the focus on somebody else's bad behavior that might have caused something rather than anything that they did. The wolves that commit financial elder abuse oftentimes take everything that the elder has and leave them with nothing. It's so cruel, there's no human feeling that you can discern when someone who says they have their entire life savings in one or more bank accounts and they're taken advantage of and everything is gone. When a bad actor decides to victimize a vulnerable elder, they're gonna take them for all they got. And they generally do not care whether the elder is left with half their fortune or a quarter, they want it all. And so just like a wolf hunting elk, they're gonna strip that elk bear and they're predators, so they're going for broke. Children, even though vigilant for their parents' well-being, are often kept in the dark as to when their parents are experiencing a scheme that's designed to take their parents' assets. People often don't like to admit that they are losing a step, getting older, don't fully understand what they're getting into. You know, people don't like to lose their sense of independence, and they also don't want to bother their children. They've got careers, they've got families. So it can be really easy to catch one of those vulnerable adults in a situation where they're not gonna be sharing it with somebody else. And they might feel embarrassed if they do realize what's been going on. It's really hard to make sure all the time that your parents, grandparents are safe. I had my own personal experience of my mother being victimized. It motivated me to share a lot of things that I know in a book. And we started to look at our own cases and other cases throughout the country with an idea, for the most part, relaying to the general public the lessons that I'd learned and the warnings that I'd like to share. It really wasn't written for lawyers, although lawyers do review it, but I wrote it for people like me, and they'd like to read it and have it less legalese and more common sense. Family dynamics are at the heart of trust beneficiary disputes. The biggest disputed asset is usually the family home. Undue influence can swing millions of dollars from rightful beneficiaries to a wrongdoer. These cases are about money, often a lot of money. Intense preparation goes a long way toward resolution. 
Call Hackard Law today to schedule your free trust dispute consultation. We'll work to get you the money you deserve. Within a very short period of time after entering Rona's life, Deputy Amos took several actions to effectively gain full control over Rona's life. So Deputy Amos moves Rona into her own personal residence, doesn't inform any of the neighbors, including Peggy, who had been helping Rona. And then she proceeds to start clearing out Rona's house. Peggy gets a bit suspicious as to what happened to Rona. So she puts a phone call into the law enforcement agency. That prompts internal affairs and a criminal investigation at the department to find out what's going on. January 26, 2018, 7.45 a.m. Surveillance of Amos and Miller begins. 10 a.m. Surveillance unit observes Amos and Miller meet with an HVAC employee outside for approximately 15 minutes. Deputy Amos completely gutted Rona's house ostensibly to, quote, prepare it for sale. But it was done in such a way that it seemed completely unnecessary. It wasn't like a typical sell the house as is. Um, it was a, a complete gut of the house, including all of the appliances and the toilets. Uh, and it just seemed purposeless. Then she takes Rona to a lawyer, a local lawyer, and gets the lawyer to draft up a power of attorney so that she can have control of Rona's finances. The lawyer, surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly, doesn't think this is a red flag, drafts up the power of attorney and allows Rona to sign it, granting Deputy Amos complete control over Rona's finances. January 30, 2018. Rona signs the powers of attorney for finances and healthcare, naming Amos as the current agent and Miller as the successor agent. During this week to week and a half, Deputy Amos was driving her around to appointments, including doctor's appointments. And one of the doctor's appointments was because Rona was having pain on urination. Deputy Amos takes Rona to see her doctor where he administers an MOCA test. Rona scores 18 out of 30. UTIs can cause problems with mental ability, particularly in the older population, and particularly if it's gone untreated for some amount of time. The doctor believes the dementia may be related to Rona's current living situation. The doctor believes Rona has a urinary tract infection or a UTI, which testing confirms. At that point, they go to a bank, they open up a joint banking account. Deputy Amos also gained access to the safe deposit box that Rona had at the bank. I have a lot of safe stories. And I think of one case where this fellow had married a woman who had a rather illustrious history. He had told his relatives that he had had about $300,000 in his home safe. He died, and during the funeral, someone got into the safe. And my memory of that one is that there was a combination on a piece of paper, and the piece of paper was left on the bed next to the safe, and the safe was open, and there was no cash in it. Well, of course, you can't prove it. But yet, if you're a family member and you know, hey, dad always put cash away because he thought, you know, he was going to need a lot and he didn't believe in banks. So there you go, $300,000, you can't prove it. Safety deposit boxes are set up with banks and they essentially have two keys. The bank keeps one key and the other key is given to someone who purchases the box or rents the box. And the theory behind them is that it's a safe spot to put valuable items such as jewelry or coins, money. Some people just want to keep cash around. It's kind of the depression area mentality. And we oftentimes rely upon it that it's gonna work. That's a good spot to have assets. 
People keep things in their safety deposit boxes or a safe because they don't want anyone else to get a hold of whatever's in it. Things are just meant to be kept private for the owner of that safe when they keep them in there. When it comes to a situation with a safe at home, a lot of times we find that you can't really be too sure if anybody else might have access to something. Everyone thinks that your family's not gonna fight over these things, and I wish it were true, but often people do end up fighting over things that you would never believe. So I think it's a good idea to keep an up-to-date list of all of your assets and where they're held. I have never in one of the cases that I've had seen an inventory of what was in the safe. Not once. Now I have an inventory of what's in my safe because I learned this, but it's a good idea to have an inventory of what's in your safe and have a trusted other person who has a copy of the inventory or who can access the inventory because there's gonna really be no other proof. It's just, it's gonna be a he said, she said. I'm Mike Hackard with Hackard Law. I handled my first contingency fee dispute over 40 years ago. We don't get paid until our clients get paid. We litigate disputed trust cases before judges and juries. We know red flag signaling, altered or switched to state plans, undue influence, Alzheimer's, dementia, and vulnerability are common topics. Call Hackard Law today to schedule your free trust dispute consultation. We'll work to get you the money you deserve. Upon review of the documents produced regarding the internal investigation, it became clear that the surveillance missed most of the important activities pertinent to the investigation, including taking Rona to the bank, taking Rona to the estate planning lawyer's office, and taking Rona to the airport. This trip, is it a round trip? It should be a round trip, but our story is on one way. When I first heard about Rona's case, the most stunning thing to me to, to hear about was the one-way ticket that the sheriff's deputies had bought for Rona out of the country. So Deputy Amos expedited a passport for Rona. She got the passport. She booked air travel on the internet for Rona. And then she put Rona in her car, drove her to the airport, parked her car, walked Rona through airport security all the way to the gate and made sure she got on the plane to this foreign country and then walked out of the airport without a care in the world. From what we can piece together from Rona's time in the foreign country, she didn't know what she was doing there. She didn't know how she got there. She didn't know how to get from the airport to her family's residence. We were able to piece together that a taxi driver who had been making repeated trips to the airport kept seeing Rona standing on the side of the road at the airport for several hours and finally pulled over and talked to her and asked what was going on and I guess took pity on her and drove her around until they found the family's residence and dropped her off there. And was the family surprised to see her? The family had no idea that Rona was coming. They didn't know that uh, she was on her way. Uh, Rona claimed to have no money. She was worried because she didn't know how she was going to pay for anything when she got there because she had no money in her pockets. One of the most interesting aspects of this case from the get-go is that we had a vague understanding that some sort of federal law enforcement agency was involved in finding Rona and bringing her back to the United States. February 3rd, 2018, Peggy calls Deputy Amos and asks to speak with Rona. Amos lies and tells her Rona's at the store with Miller and will be back later. So Peggy, the neighbor and the friend of Rona, when she determines that Rona's missing and the last people to have seen Rona were Deputy Amos and Deputy Miller, she calls the department and initiates this chain of events that start an investigation. And ultimately, through the State Department, the law enforcement agency is able to find Rona in the foreign country. They send three deputies, including one who speaks the foreign language, on a plane 
halfway around the world to go pick up Rona. And when they get there, they set up a meeting with Rona at the embassy in the country. And Rona's family brings her to the embassy and the deputies sit down with her and have several conversations with her and her family about the entire situation and what Rona wants to do. Were you trying to sell your house for any reason? No. No? Because I'd like to go back home. Okay. Do you remember talking to any police officers back home? I don't remember anything that, no, that far. I was told that someone is buying my house. Who is selling my house? Who the hell is she? You don't know her? No. Okay. How about this guy, do you know him? Holy Toledo, I don't know these people. You don't know those people? Okay. And the deputy specifically asked Rona, do you want to go back to the United States? And she says, yes, I want to go home. So power of attorney is when you say, someone else is going to make all of my decisions for me. There no way is. someone else will make the decision for me. No way. I, I made my own decision. The FBI's official data for internet-based scams against seniors shows that $3 billion of damage has been inflicted against elders. Now that's only the official figure, and that's only what's reported. From what we know of how fraud works, the unreported cases are many times greater. The biggest growth in these types of senior scams, typically they're done from online platforms, sometimes in conjunction with phone services, but they're often operated from call centers, and sometimes those call centers are all the way in South Asia. And it's very hard to trace back to the criminals and get the money back once it's stolen. It's unfortunate, but a senior can lose their entire life savings from these scams. There's always someone out there ready to take advantage of you. Most of us like to lead peaceful lives and not think that we have a wolf at the door every time that we're in our home. There's somebody out there that wants your money and somebody out there that has no mercy. So typically in a grandparent scam, an elderly person will get a telephone call or they'll receive a message and it's supposedly their grandchild. The grandchild says that they're trapped in a foreign country or they're in jail in another state and they need the grandparents' help. And they need immediate money in order to get out of jail in order to come home. But they don't want anyone else to know because that could cause embarrassment or alarm and they tell the grandparent, don't tell anyone else about this. And so oftentimes the senior will just be frazzled. Like, I've got to take care of this right now. So the scammer will then direct the grandparent under the guise of being the grandchild to transfer some amount of funds, often thousands of dollars, into an account that the scammer has prepared. So the money's transferred. Of course, there is no grandchild who's really threatened, and the grandchild did not participate in this. So that that's a common one. It's also just so reprehensible. A key part of these scams is social engineering, and there is a high sense of urgency conveyed to the senior that action must be taken immediately. Critical thinking is something that scammers hate. They don't want you to do your homework. They don't want you to double check what they're saying. When you're up against a scam, don't lose your cool. Think twice and contact a relevant authority, whether that be your bank, police, talk to many people. Don't keep it all in one box with the suspected scammer because they will hurt you. People who are victims of scams should not be embarrassed. They should come forward as soon as possible. There is no reason to be ashamed. These things happen to thousands of people across the country every day. Tell your story. Forewarned is forearmed. And the more knowledge we have about this, the better. My name's Dan Collins, and I have served as a court appointed representative over companies, states, and individuals for many years. I work with a lot of different attorneys in different disciplines, and what I enjoy about working with Hacker Law is they afford people the opportunity who do not have money to pay attorneys to be able to get access to what is rightfully theirs. Call Hacker Law today to schedule your free trust dispute consultation. We'll work to get you the money you deserve. February 21st, 2018, 
Detectives fly back to the U.S. with Rona. Upon landing in the U.S., the detectives take Rona to a medical center for treatment. The deputies often report that Rona is scared, forgetful, and does not know where she is. The way this case played out from a legal representation standpoint felt a little bit like a relay team. My colleague and I here at Hackard Law were speaking with a local attorney friend about a different case. That lawyer brought up Rona's case because he was handling it. And then it wasn't long after that conversation that our lawyer friend reached out to us to see if we were interested in taking over the case. It took this whole team's effort to put our heads together to bring this case to a resolution. I had quite a bit of involvement in this case, actually. One of the big issues was trying to find Deputy Amos and Deputy Miller because after the investigation, they ended up being fired and they kind of disappeared from the area. So I had to try and find them and ultimately we found them and we got them served and they gave me a call almost immediately upon being served and wanted to talk about the case. They were claiming that they had nothing but the best of intentions for Rona, that Deputy Amos does have a history of getting personally involved with people she helps, that she feels the system has failed. And in this case, as I mentioned before, she got a commendation for her actions at that first welfare check where she took Rona out to a meal so they felt like, look, the department shouldn't give us commendations and then turn around and say, but we can't do anything else to help these people. And so they felt they were in the right. It might seem upon first blush, clearly Deputy Amos and Deputy Miller are at fault here. But when you zoom out and you look at all the documents and the information, it becomes clear the department overseeing the deputies is really responsible. If they had supervised their deputies better, they would have known that the two deputies were making unsolicited return visits to Rona's house, and they could have found out why and stopped that. They could have also, when they started surveillance on Deputy Amos, they could have simply gone up to Deputy Amos's house, knocked on her door and said, hey, deputy, we've got a complaint that Rona is missing and you were the last person to see her. Do you know where she is? And if they had done that and Deputy Amos had told the truth and said, yeah, she's living with me, she never would have been sent to the foreign country and probably her mental acuity would not have continued to diminish. After living in the same home for 44 years, in a period of two months, Rona lived in six different places, major changes to her life that ultimately disrupted her cognition, her physical health, and completely changed her life. March 23rd, 2018, Rona is discharged to a memory care facility. This case ultimately resolved by way of a settlement. In some ways, this case felt a little anticlimactic and sad because unfortunately Rona passed away. And so there was a personal sadness about losing a client. And there was also a disappointment as to how that impacted the end result of the case. Well, the best you can do in a case like this is you don't have a time machine, so you can't reverse it. So what are the cases ultimately about? The cases are ultimately about money. We got her basically, and it ended up being her estate, a lot of money. Was that particularly satisfying? Well, given the circumstances, it was probably as satisfying as we were ever going to be. And when I looked at it and looked at my law firm's involvement and the kind of passion that we put into that case and effort, I'm, I'm happy with what we did. I wish he had lived uh, to be able to have some of the benefits of that, but her family will. The biggest takeaway from this case is that the people who are there to protect us, the people we call when there's a problem, don't necessarily have our best intentions at heart. And even if in this case they did have the best of intentions, they still violated policy and didn't do what the law says they should have done. And because of that, an elderly woman suffered. We did get a fair amount of background information that this law enforcement department really paid attention to this 
case. I think they've done their own internal changes to try to make sure nothing like this ever happens again.